Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. You're listening to the Deal Room Podcast. Join us as we bring you the inside scoop on business sales and acquisitions. Get across trends in the area and hear the industry's best recount their real life tips, traps, and experiences. Now, here's your host, Joanna Oki. Hi, it's Joanna Oki here and welcome back to the Deal Room Podcast, a podcast proudly brought to you by our commercial legal practice, Aspect Legal. Now, today we have on the show Craig West from Succession Plus. Craig is a strategic accountant with over 20 years experience advising business owners and he is now a strategic business and financial mentor for mid-market business owners and has also written not one, not two, but four books educating business owners all about employee incentives, succession planning, asset protection and exit strategies. And in today's episode, I'm talking to Craig all about the concept of business succession and exit planning. So today we look particularly at what the biggest mistakes are that owners make and some of those issues that occur time and time again. But we also dig into one of the issues that I see which is it's one thing to know that it's important for business owners to think about exit well before the time of exit. But how do we actually communicate this message to them? Because that is in reality one of the hardest things that there is to do, not just recognising that clients or prospects, businesses need education well in advance of an exit, but how do we bring them along and make them see that when all they are focused on is growth? We also have a bit of a look at what the best way is to increase sale value at exit. And we finish off by looking at the most novel ways Craig has seen people extract the best value at exit. All of this and more. So buckle in, we're going to talk to Craig. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. You're listening to The Deal Room Podcast. Join us as we bring you the inside scoop on business sales and acquisitions. Get across trends in the area. And hear the industry's best recount their real-life tips, traps, and experiences. Now, here's your host, Joanna Oki. Okay, Craig, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Great. Okay, so I want to start by talking about your book that relates to business succession and exit planning. But before we do that, maybe just give us a quick introduction to who you are and what what preceded writing the book, I guess. Yeah, so my background is as an accountant. Uh, I did a lot of work advising business owners at that time when I had an accounting practice, I then did a master's in tax law focused on capital gains tax, mainly around sale of business and the small business concessions. And I advised about 20 other accounting firms and their clients on the CGT aspects of selling a business. What I saw as a result of doing that, I probably wrote 200 letters of advice over sort of several years. What I saw as a result of doing that was probably out of the 200, 198 really bad exits. People that sold too early or too late, people that sold in the wrong structures and paid too much tax, people that sold to the wrong buyer altogether and therefore didn't get the right price, Um, badly prepared businesses, badly prepared documents, you name it. I mean, everything that you could possibly think of that people do wrong in exiting, I saw in those sort of 200 examples. And what I realized then was that the CGT is not the main game. It's important to get it right. And there are lots of people out there that do that. But what I realized was business owners and most often their advisors as well, didn't know and understand the best way to prepare a business for an exit. And so I went away and actually designed this version of Enjoy It, the book you're talking about, is actually the fifth edition. The first one I wrote was back in 2005, and it was a very early, simple, it's less than a quarter of the size of this one, and it's got a nine-step process to prepare your business for sale. The current version's got a 21-step process, which is much more detailed, much more complicated, and much more involved because I started to just refine it as I saw what people were doing wrong. 
if we've gone from nine to 21 in five iterations, how many more iterations can we expect, Craig? And are we going to get up to 100? <laughs> we've been at 21 for quite a while now. Oh, the, okay, last, good, good. the last three editions of the book have been at 21 steps. And I don't think you need any more than that. I think what we've been doing is refining how those 21 steps are actually managed and implemented. There are so many questions that I have burning right now in what you're talking about, Craig, but I think you raise some excellent topics because quite often we see businesses, well, businesses will come to us at the exit point when commercial terms have already been agreed. So as lawyers, we're often brought in to a new client in that element quite late in the process. And I just, the first thing we do is we look at the deal as a whole and the business as a whole. And so many times I just look at it and I say, oh my goodness, I just feel, you know, if you had have come and seen us just a bit earlier, there's so many things that could have been done with the business to make this a much easier, smoother and higher value sale. And it's just really frustrating as an advisor to not be able to make massive differences when they're brought to us so late. So, I I mean, I guess, you know, this is probably what drove you (laughs) to um, create a book like this. So, I'd I'd really like to drill into some of these areas of the mistakes that you saw people make. So, what are the most common from your perspective? I'm interested that you say that CGT isn't the biggest because that's certainly an issue that I see again and again. So I'd be interested to hear what your perceptions on what the biggest mistakes are. I think the number one biggest mistake and the one that I see more often than not, you've already mentioned, and that is the fact that people leave it till too late. People think it's a little bit like selling a property. You know, ultimately you can go and get a real estate agent, they'll list it, you know, it takes a couple of days to list it, they'll get it on the internet. An auction marketing campaign runs for three or four weeks and the house will get sold. And that pretty well always happens. You know, you might have to reduce the price slightly, but it pretty much always happens. Businesses never work like that. There's never a sale like that. It just doesn't happen like that. And the the fact that most people leave it until late ultimately costs them money and often costs them, you know, poor terms and other parts of the the transaction don't work so well. And it can all be avoided just by starting early. I tell people, you know, Steve Covey's second habit in the um, seven habits is begin with the end in mind. And I tell my clients all the time, the day you start is the day you should start thinking about your exit. Now, you don't have to exit yet, but you should start to build the business and the documents and everything around you with the exit in mind, because you'll always get a better result if you do that. I completely agree with you. But one of the issues I see in the market is trying to have this conversation with businesses who are really focused on growth, is, which is you know an obvious phase that businesses go through. They're so focused on growth that they can't hear the messaging in relation to the importance of understanding what exit looks like. Even though you know I often find they're spinning their wheels creating the business in one particular way for growth when really all they needed to do at that point was make a few small additions to what they're considering, a few changes in what they're doing at that point and it would have made this massive difference at the end of the day in terms of sale value. This messaging piece is something that interests me because I just find that business owners who are in growth, that's what they're looking at. It's hard to, hard for them to care about exit at that point because they're so focused on growth. Do you, do you see that issue and how do you deal with it if so? Yeah, I do see that issue a lot. I think it's hard for business owners to focus on an exit when they're so busy worrying about, you know, even the, the minutiae of, you know, there's a BAS that's got to be lodged and there's a wages payment that's got to come up and you've got to collect debtors and you've got to send out invoices and all the things that we do day to day mean that we forget or we put off or we, you know, leave in the too hard basket for a while the exit strategy. And yet that's where the big money's made in every single business. Business I've ever worked with, you know, they might be very profitable, making good money, and as you said, growing, and that's all fantastic. But at the end of the day, the big money comes from getting the exit right. And so I talk to people about dedicating some time to work specifically on that. Now, whether that's a day a month, ideally, whether it's, you know, I work from home every Friday and I spend Friday 
doing strategic things. You know, I don't spend it writing emails and sending letters to clients and doing billing or any of that sort of stuff. I work on the strategy. Now, obviously, part of the strategy for any business is their exit strategy. What's their end game? And I think the other important point around that is that a lot of the things that we do, you know, there are several, I'm I'm thinking probably eight to 10 steps that I've outlined in the book that are just good business sense. They're not specifically about exiting. So for example, one of the steps talks about sales and marketing. It's not about exiting. It's about getting your sales and marketing ready. And why is that in there? It's in there because that's something that buyers are looking for. So I often tell my clients to think about their business as if they were a buyer. What would a buyer like to see in terms of how your sales and marketing works? Or what would a buyer like to see in terms of the way your people are, you know, performance managed, what KPIs have you got? How do you reward them? What incentive plans are in place? Because that's what's ultimately important. At one point, somewhere in the future, a buyer is going to look at your business and you want to have built it with that buyer in mind because then you'll get a better price. And have you got any examples, Craig, of when you've seen this done really well and when you've seen it done really poorly? Yeah, look, I think um, let's start with the really poorly one first because there's hundreds of those. (laughs) Yeah, the most simple things are that people make decisions based on a short-term need today. So, for example, how many business owners have gone into their accountant and how many accountants or advisors have heard a business owner say, listen, I've got my P&L, can you just reduce my tax? And accountants can do all sorts of wonderful things to do that and they charge management fees and they do this and that and the the tax is magically reduced. But what they've actually done is reduce the sales price by three times the tax they would have paid. So they're making a decision based on how do I pay less tax in, you know, 2019 tax return, but in 2022 when they go to sell the business, that impacts directly on the calculation the buyer makes. And so... The theme there is we're making short-term decisions that really do prejudice the long-term result that we get. Mm. And, you know, tax and accounting is just one example. There are stacks of those where people take shortcuts or they do something to say, oh, that'll do, that'll, that'll sort itself out for now. We'll come back and fix it later. And, of course, they never do because they're too busy doing everything else. Mm. And so the things that people do poorly, you know, the documentation, policies and the simple stuff, policies and procedures, systems, the measurement and reporting of their business is really quite an issue because buyers want to look at that stuff. And that's a really good segue into the really the things that work really well. The best example I've got, I sold a business several years ago now to a listed company. And one of the main reasons that sale went so well and the buyer got far more than they expected to get was because we had five years of board meeting minutes. Wow. And all the reporting that went with it and detailed KPIs and action plans and you know the action register was updated every single month for five years. So the listed company came in and looked at it and just went, wow, this is a really well-run business because you can tell that just by looking at the board documents. You know, things were recorded, the performance was measured really financially, non-financially, accidents, employees, you know, IT issues, everything was documented really well. And if there was an issue, it was raised and there was an action register and that was assigned to, you know, John Smith to solve the problem. And next month we got a report back from John that the problem was solved and it's all documented. From a buyer's point of view, that's heaven. That's Nirvana. They're looking at that just saying, okay, this is, I know with quite a high level of confidence, this company has been well run because I can see it here in front of me. Now, most businesses don't go to that length. Some of them don't even have board meetings. Those that do don't record them properly. And, you know, that's just a simple example. It's not even that expensive to do that, but it's well worth doing because the buyer rates that really highly and they will pay more money for a business that looks like that. Absolutely. Okay. And as you're talking, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of some really recent examples that I've seen. I mean, we see examples like this over and over and over again, but one, a matter that just completed for us a few weeks ago, the clients came in and they were in, they had seen their lawyers and accountants five years previously when they were considering selling into the future. So they had this five-year plan and they did the right thing. They went and saw their advisors to let them know that they um, were thinking about selling and the advice had been at the time by an ad- another advisor that had worked with them, a manager in um, and a management board, which was excellent. And they'd done that. But what they'd not done and the advisors had not done at the time was think about what the right structure would be for 
the organisation at sale. And when they got to sale, their broker, a corporate advisor, found a deal for them. But the way it was structured was as a business sale, not a share sale. The way that they were set up, it really needed to be a share sale, which, as we all know, is certainly achievable if you approach it at the right time or they could be restructured if need be. But in this particular case, they left more than a million dollars on the table, I think, because of the way they had dealt with the sale. And I just like, that's such a classic example to me. And it was too late to do anything about it. But I just looked at it and I just thought, you know, I just don't know the extent to which advisors realise. It wasn't just the price. It's also, there were a number of other things that just weren't cleaned up in the business and that could have been cleaned up so easily with a five-year runway, you know? And I just thought, it's interesting, isn't it? Is it that advisors are too busy and they don't wrap their heads around it or do they think it's not worthwhile spending time on or do they just not know what to be advising their clients of as they gear up for sale? And it occurred to me that, you know, maybe a lot of advisors out there don't deal a lot with their clients. They might deal with the general commercial side of accounting or legal or whatever side it is, but they just don't see enough businesses that exit to recognize these signs of what they should be doing. Do you think that's an issue in the market? Is that something that you see? Yeah, I think there's two sort of key things that stand out. One is that this is a specialized area of operation. This is not general accounting advice or general legal advice Yeah. where, you know, I've used a little bit of a medical analogy. You know, this is not a job for a GP. This is a heart surgeon we're talking about. And so there's a level of expertise and experience that makes a big difference in these transactions. If you can get them right, it's about being experienced and having the knowledge and expertise in that specific area around how you prepare and design an exit strategy that works. The other part you mentioned, I mean, I think advisors generally, as well as business owners, are just too busy. You know, they've got so many things on so many things they've got to worry about. When you think now about most small to medium business owners and the areas that they've got to be across, you know, they've got to be across employment law and, you know, then they've got to be across accounting and tax and super and workers comp and all the other areas that small business managers and owners need to be right across and their advisors just means that that GP approach is the only way you can get everything done. And that's why I said before, you know, I think you've got to dedicate some time specifically to focus on these sort of strategic projects within your business. Now, whether that's to acquire another business and grow or whether that's to set up a new marketing and sales funnel or whether it's to design your exit strategy, you know, if you put aside as a business owner, you know, a day or fortnight, let's say every second Friday you work from home and you just worked on those sorts of things, the difference within 12 months is amazing. It's just that most people don't do it. I think you're absolutely right. And it's it's a really a good, sensible, practical, and sort of easy to follow advice, even though, you know, obviously you have to carve that time out. You know, if you can do that within your business, I completely agree that the return is, you know, astronomic. But let's say we have listeners who are listening in and who are sold on that idea as business owners. What are the elements that you would recommend to them to go through to uh, to prepare themselves for exit to um, to build the value in the right way in the business so that it has the right value at sale. Yeah, you know, I think there's sort of two key things. One, you've got to find out where you're at today, and the way to do that generally is to get your business valued or appraised. Get a get a realistic view of what you've actually got. Most business owners are very unrealistic about what their valuation is. They come in two schools. One is that you know my business is worth nothing. I'm happy just to get rid of it. And you, you know I've had one guy who actually came to see me and said, look, I've heard you can liquidate. I just want to close it all down and get rid of it. And I sold it for $8 million. And, you know, his view was it was worth zero, but he got $8 million. But I also get the other end of the spectrum where people come in and talk to you about their business and they say, oh, look, I'd be happy to sell it for $20 million. And you've got to be honest with them and just say, listen, you're not going to get two. <laughs> I don't know where your 20 comes from, but it's not even close. Uh. And that's quite a challenge. So I think the first step is get a clear, realistic view of what your business is actually worth and where you're at. And and not only the number, that the number's not that important actually, but what drives that number? Why is it worth $2 million, not 20? Mm. What is it about your business that makes it worth $2 million? And what could you do to make it worth three or four or five? What do you have to do to get to that point? And we, the first stage of our process is around actually that, getting a valuation and an assessment and some recommendations around what you can do to grow the value. Then what you've got to do is dedicate some time and effort to put into that, to actually say, okay, there's 10 things here that I've seen and I now know have driven my valuation at 2 million. 
I want to get to five. What do I need to do? And those 10 things need to be done. And they're going to be done over a couple of years probably. They're not going to happen next week. So it is about just dedicating the time but having a plan around knowing what to do because most business owners, if you said, okay, dedicate half a day a week to designing and building an exit strategy, they're not going to know where to start. Yeah. Get some advice, get good advice, get a strategic plan around what you want to do and that sometimes involves things like conversations with family. It's so, okay, what does it look like? I'm in business with you know my two brothers. Dad's about to retire. Do we want to buy it off him? Do we want to sell it? Do we want to take it over? Do we want to keep it for our kids? Or is there some other plan? You know, do we just want to build it up and sell it and take the money and go and do something else? And often people don't have that conversation till it's too late. You know, they wait till dad gets really ill or they wait till there's a big family dispute. Yeah. And then they've got to sort it out and it ends up in with lawyers and it gets all difficult because they didn't have the conversations they needed to have up front around the plan. You know, what is the plan? Yeah, I completely agree. Absolutely. And I guess one question that I have for you, I don't know if you have an answer to this, but what is the most novel way that you've seen people extract the best value at exit? Have there been any, you know, really uh, interesting manoeuvres that you've uh, sat back and said, you know what, that was an interesting one? Yeah, there's a few. And I mean, the, the big things to think about are around when you've got time, you can actually do some smart things. Mm. So, for example, you know, I sold a business, as I said, many years ago to a listed company. The listed company were actually competitors of my client. Mm. And so what we did as a client, we did two things. We went into any particular business where we were quoting or providing a sales proposal that was provided by this competitor, we undercut the price on purpose. And the reason they did that was at every sales meeting in the competitor's office, the name of this company kept coming up. Oh, that bloody company undercut us again. So it was constantly <laughs> talked about. Oh, I love it. The second thing we did was, and this I've used this quite a few times, we actually engaged a PR firm to write some publicity about how successful the company was, how it was growing so quickly, how they put in place, for example, they put in an employee share plan, mm. which was part of the strategy. But what we did was use that from a publicity point of view to talk about the fact that we've got fantastic staff and we've locked them in and they're now all on an equity plan, so they're all working with us to grow the value of the business. Now, the buyer's reading all this going, my God, I've got to find out what's happening in this company. It's all over the place. And so that strategy worked really well. You know, we got a very successful sale there. But as I said earlier on, that's like a three to five year plan. You yeah. can't do that stuff in six weeks. That takes a lot of work. works really well, but it's about having a strategy around how you actually do that. I love it. They're really good examples. <laughs> All right. Well, look, maybe we'll have you back um, one day soon, Craig, to talk more about that employee share plan option, because I think that that's a really interesting element to consider for businesses as a whole and, and maybe businesses who are gearing up for an exit. But I just want to say a very big thank you for coming on board. And I guess just, you know, any parting tips for our listeners out there who might be business owners or might also be advisors to business owners in relation to this whole area of business succession and exit planning? Yeah, I think the big tip is start as early as you can. So if you're a business owner, start to talk to people, start to think about what your exit looks like. And if you're an advisor, start to talk to your clients about this topic. Absolutely. You know, what are you doing about an exit? Have you thought about it? Let's do some, you know, let's get a book and read about it. Let's watch a webinar, whatever, to educate yourself and your clients about what the options are and how you prepare for them. And you cannot start too early. Yeah, I completely agree. Absolutely agree. Well, Craig, it has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on board. If any of our listeners want to make contact with you or even grab a copy of your book, how do they do that? Yeah, the easiest way is just email. So it's cwest at successionplus.com.au. And uh, I'm happy to send them a copy of the book if they want one as well to have a look at and get a bit of an idea around how it all works. Excellent. Okay. And if you are running on the beach or on on your commute into work at the moment, have no fear. We will put the link to Craig in our show notes. So you can just check out our show notes and the link will be there. Excellent. Thank you, Craig. Look forward to having you back again. Thanks for having me. Well, that's it for today's episode of the Deal Room podcast. In today's episode, I think we covered some really interesting topics and hopefully, whether or not you're a business owner out there who is now convinced that they need to think about exit well in advance of the time 
sign that you wish to exit or whether you are an advisor who deals with business owners and is now sold on the reality of the importance of helping our clients and prospects build for exit well in advance of exit. I really hope you've taken something useful out of today's podcast. If you'd like more information about this topic, then all you need to do is head over to our website at www.thedealroompodcast.com. There you'll also find links straight through to Craig if you would like to talk to him in more detail or get a copy of one of his books. And there you'll also find details of how to contact our lawyers at Aspect Legal. If you or your clients would like to discuss any legal aspects of sales or acquisitions or preparation for sales and acquisitions. And finally, if you enjoyed what you heard today, then I would absolutely love it if you could possibly pop over to iTunes or your favorite podcast player. Make sure you hit subscribe and leave us a review telling us what you thought about this episode or our podcast as a whole. Well, that's it. Thanks again for listening in. See you next time. You've been listening to Joanna Oki and the Deal Room Podcast. Aspect Legal has a number of great services that help businesses prepare for a sale or acquisition to help them prepare in advance and to get transaction ready. We've also got a range of services to help guide businesses through the sale and acquisitions process. We work with clients both big and small and have different types of services depending on size and complexity. We provide a free consultation to discuss your proposed sale or acquisition. So see our show notes on how to book a time to speak with us or head over to our website at aspectlegal.com.au. Ladies and gentlemen, that will conclude this evening's entertainment. Thanks for listening to The Deal Room Podcast. To find out more about this episode and other episodes in the series, check out the show notes or head over to our website at thedealroompodcast.com.au. 